Filipino United Church of Canada Partners online conference. Yesterday, we had a wonderful first day, and some of you might have already received the recording. If you didn't and you would like to have it, please do uh, uh, send something in the chat and we can send it over to you. You're very welcome, and uh, we we're going to listen to our other partners who did not have the opportunity to share their stories of joy, their stories of struggle, as we continue in the bigger agenda of mending the world. And uh, ICHEP is here with us, and so Patricia Lison, the chairperson of ICHEP Canada, uh, will also give us um, uh, a bit of a talk in terms of what is Canada doing in responding to some of these challenges uh, that uh, are taking place or happening. So for opening, we have our very own Bishop Rex uh, to open for us in a word of devotion, in a word of prayer. Bishop Rex, what a joy, what a joy to be with you this evening, this morning. Welcome, welcome, and good to have you here. Over to you. Good morning. Uh, the prayer that I will use is that uh, comes from my region, which makes reference to the word uh, lamin, or the coolness that is literally brought about by the wind. Uh, lamin is, uh, I think, the closest. Uh, biblical language or word is abundant life or uh, fullness of life. So when we say uh, we are simply saying may we all have a full life. So uh, I will uh, say it in English although I can, see, I can see Lendel here who can articulate it very well in our common language, but I will uh, spare him the trouble. <laughs> I have caused him enough trouble, so I will spare him this trouble at this time. Uh, let us pray then. East wind, blow the light that radiates truth and freedom. West wind, blow the unity that binds creation in harmony. North wind, blow the coolness and freshness of our resolves. Wind of the south, Blow the wisdom of our parents and of their parents before them and the relationship that will sustain creation. In the name of God, who is wind. Amen. Amen. Thank you very much, uh, Bishop Rex, for that opening uh, yes. prayer. I'm glad I... You're muted. You're muted, Bishop. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jaffet, for the privilege. And uh, I apologize for not attending yesterday's, but I did watch the YouTube uh, the reason why I found out that you gave me a task this morning. So. <laughs> I am glad you did. Thank you very much, Bishop. Our first update this evening or this morning, dear friends, will be from the Ecumenical Bishops Forum, for which Bishop Rex is a co-chair. And uh, uh, over to you. Uh, I think it's Bishop Rex and... Uh, Awful, so that will be. Oh, no, 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 sorry, 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 sorry. Let me, it's a UCCP, sorry, Reverend Frank. <laughs> sorry, uh, EBF will be the second one. So, the United Church of Christ in the Philippines 
Reverend Frank and Bishop Labuntog. I don't know how they have planned to do this, but uh, over to you, uh, colleagues from uh, the United Church of Christ in the Philippines. Uh, Reverend Frank will do the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Bishop. Reverend Frank, over to you. Thank you, Jopet. Thank you, Bishop Melsar. Bishop Melsar will add some missing parts of my presentation. Um, what uh, we prepare uh, is a long state of the church, but we have updated it. And I'm going to skip many slides, you know, in the uh, PowerPoint presentation uh, as a screen share. Um, I will start with um, the most recent uh, updates in the United Church of Christ in the Philippines. Then along the way, I'm going to jump to um, uh, the impact of COVID-19 on the UCCP. And um, what are the things that we have done so far in terms of uh, relief uh, assistance program to uh, our church workers and the communities where our churches are located. Um, I would like to share my screen. Sorry, I'm unable to make co-hosts. Okay, perfect, thank you. Okay. Um, let's see. So show. Uh, just play from start. It should be the first button that you to go back up to what you were looking at. Yeah. Um, Is it visible? Mm -hmm. We can just see the slides on the side. So it would be a little bit better if we can see the whole thing. So All you right. can click um, view or slideshow and play from start, which should be the first you, button. Keep going. Okay. Oh. Uh, sorry, the one you were just at, slideshow was perfect at the top. Up, sorry, slideshow. Uh, I messed up. Two over. There you go. Okay. Slideshow. Oh, your, your arrow's going the other way. Go left. Go left. Okay. Yeah, there. <laughs> the slideshow. See, it says slideshow. There uh, you go. Uh, you were uh, just on it before. Uh, Pastor Frank, uh, yeah. lagay mo dyan sa slideshow between the review. Slideshow. <laughs> review animation. Oh. Uh, <laughs> may, hindi. Yeah. Ayan. Katalina, uh, slideshow. Yan. 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 Sige, then, pindi mo yan. Then, then play, play from the current start. slide. Yan. Play from current slide. Okay. okay. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> um, based on the uh, state of the church report, we were able to uh, summarize our experience as a church with this uh, text from the Bible. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be made visible in our bodies. For while we live, we are always being given up to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus may be made visible in our mortal flesh. So death is at work in us, but life in you. From Second Corinthians chapter four, verses eight and nine. The CCP Office of the General Secretary, through our Bishop Nozar Labuntog, or General Secretary, would like to express his gratitude to all partners and to the entire UCCP um, for sustaining their support and prayers for the entire Church, the United Church of Christ in the Philippines. We welcome this opportunity to share the objective situation of the ECCP and the overview of the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic and the series of typhoons that visited the country. 
and some points of consideration in the wider society as the state's economic, political, and social policies have slid further to repression of civil liberties and human rights. We hope that this encapsulated information will strengthen our connectedness as God's global household of faith. So as we all know, uh, the Philippines has experienced recent typhoons and the one uh, that recently visited uh, was Typhoon Raleigh in the uh, national, the national name, but international name is Goni, with its category as Super Typhoon for the year, with packing winds of 310 kilometers per hour, devastated provinces uh, in the Bicol region, such as Catanuanes, Camarines, Albay, and neighboring provinces. So the most affected areas are the Bicol area, as reported by our South Luzon jurisdiction uh, from their assessment of the calamity. Um, so uh, electric power and communications in most of the provinces are still down. Uh, in Albay, Camarines Norte, Catanuanes, Masbati, Naga, and parts of Camarines Sur. Um, these are the most affected areas in the Bicol area. Also a report from North Bicol Conference mentioned that municipalities of Caramuan, Presentacion, Gachitorina, Camarines Sur were also devastated, causing also our churches located in these areas. Uh, yeah, affected by the typhoon. Um, on November 1st, 20 casualties were reported in Albay and Catanduanes. From the 2.3 million vulnerable people in the worst affected areas, around 95,000 families or 268,000 individuals were displaced in various parts of Bicol. Uh, the majority of them now are in different evacuation centers. But from yesterday, there were some people who have returned to their homes if their homes are still livable, but majority are still looking for means to repair their homes. In Quezon province, as of November 1st, uh, it was stated that there were 4,911 families, uh, family evacuees of 18,783 individuals in temporary shelter in at least 201 evacuation schools in central Quezon province. So most of the evacuation centers are school buildings, uh, covered courts, barangay offices, churches, chapels in the different parts of the province. In Mimaropa, Mimaropa meaning Mindoro, Marinduque, Rumblon, and Palawan. These are the uh, uh, islands in Southern Luzon. As of November 2, reports from Mimaropa declared that there are at least 127,863 persons or 36,000 families in different evacuation areas. In the region, there was one fisherman reported missing and one dead, a 78-year-old man due to typhoon rolling. So um, this is the initial estimate of the damage to livelihood and agriculture. Super typhoon rolling caused large damage to agriculture Initially, an estimated of uh, 1.1 billion pesos was lost from high-value crops in the whole of the Philippines, centered in the Bicol region. Um, almost 368,000 individuals are now evacuated to the different centers and facing also the risk of COVID-19 uh, illness due to congestion of people inside evacuation centers. Um, so uh, what was mentioned by the South Luzon jurisdiction are the needs for relief operation, ready to eat food, mineral water, toiletries, medicines, sleeping mats, face masks, and shields. The CCP has already uh, posted on Facebook uh, the call for donation. Um, you can check the UCCP uh, Facebook page and uh, you can share your uh, donations for the relief program that the South Luzon jurisdiction will be coordinating and delivering to the people. Also, uh, we have the recent update on the state attacks on the United Church of Christ in the Philippines. Uh, this is one of the pressing issues that the church is facing right now, and the Council of Bishops believe that 
the state attacks is expressed in various ways, and one of these is the red tagging of church leaders, pastors, and bishops, and even ordinary members who have been accompanying our suffering people in the different regions and localities. The church has been providing shelter for the indigenous people or lumads and help assert their pursuit of peaceful life in their ancestral lands. And advocacy for the poor to have decent jobs and social services are afforded them. So uh, it has become uh, a uh, starking mission and ministry work in the in the different regions and uh, the state is uh, for the state uh, the government of the philippines it is a sore for them in terms of uh, administration so therefore the church has been subjected to attacks living out the love of god and exercising your prophetic witness for human life is violated and human dignity has been relegated to the sidelines in turn instead of the center of all economic and political developments. In the light of this, the Council of Bishops insistently issued statements condemning the government's stances. On August 13, these are the recent uh, statements on the attacks on the state. The COB issued a statement saying, whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil. The Council of Bishops of the UCCP strongly abhors the most recent spiteful tagging of our fellow bishop and Council of Bishops member, Bishop Pamuel G. Tikes of Southeast Mindanao jurisdiction. As a CPP member, as contained in a propaganda poster posted near the building of Santa Ana Catholic Church in Davao City, seen early morning, August 13, 2020, by concerned witnesses. Copies of the same poster are placed in electrical poles near the same area in Davao City. In the same vein, recently Bishop Ruel Norman Omarigsa, UCCP Bishop Emeritus and Incumbent General Secretary of NCCP, has been maliciously red tagged as communist by the Facebook troll page Timik Tikagayan for speaking up against the anti terrorism law. This was mentioned already by Bishop Ruel yesterday. Similarly, on July 24, Reverend Ermi Balaba, UCCP church worker of the United Metropolis Conference was tagged as surrendered member of the Communist Party of the Philippines and New People's Army. Without consent, her picture was posted on Facebook page of South, Southern Luzon Command of the Armed Forces of the Philippines. Also on September 28, 2020, the Council of Bishops issued a press statement saying UCCP leaders indignant over complaint filed at the Dabo City Prosecutor's Office. This harassment that the church with the military establishment and the government itself must stop an emphatic statement coming from UCCP General Secretary Bishop Labunto upon knowing on mass media from uh, PTB and from internet news portal Double Today that several UCCP national leaders, both past and present, were named in the formal complaint at the Dabao City Prosecutor's Office. The complainants have the face of indigenous people or mads but they have been under the influence of the National Commission on Indigenous People. And this is an instigation of the National Task Force to End Localized Communist Armed Conflict, or NTF LCAC, explained Bishop Hamwell Tikes, the Davao City based UCCP bishop. Reliable mass media sources disclosed that on September 15, some Manubo tribesmen fled filed, rather, complaints before the Davao City Prosecutor's Office against several church leaders of the UCCP, Aran, and other individuals they tag as members of the New People's Army. Several of the 48 persons charged are UCCP leaders and members. Others were not fully identified for violations of Republic Act Number 9208, as amended by Republic Act Number 10364 or the Anti-Trafficking Persons Act and Republic Act 7610 or the Special Protection of Children Against Abuse, Exploitation and Discrimination Act and Republic Act number 9851 or the Philippine Act on Crimes Against International Humanitarian Law, Genocide and Other Crimes of Humanity. The CCP leaders and the Council of Bishops demand that this complaint be immediately quashed by the Dabao Prosecutor's Office. They also expressed their readiness to dialogue to settle the differences 
with the government agencies and the military establishment. There are richer matters that must be addressed with the government than persecuting and harassing the church and the nomads, the very people that government agencies have pledged to serve. So those are the two uh, statements. I just um, take out uh, the most important part of the statements. Then we have, uh, because of this ongoing harassment and attack on the UCCP, we are organizing an international solidarity virtual forum dubbed as Cry Out, Rescue Us, O oh God. This will be held on November 17, and we have already uh, sent invitations to our partners, including the United Church of Canada. So we invite our national and international partners to request from them uh, to support the United Church of Christ in the Philippines in asserting respect for human rights, the work and advocacy for social justice, the resumption of peace negotiation and other uh, carrying out and carrying out the Christian witness and service programs that respond to the needs of vulnerable people in the communities where churches are located. The call for action that we will introduce to our partners will cover several items, such as letter writing to the Philippine government and particular agencies, messages of solidarity, conduct of independent investigation of rights abuses in the Philippines, uh, by uh, whether it's uh, either the United Nations or the global ecumenical institutions like WCC, WCRC, and other non-government organizations. We hope to successfully launch this program this month. Going back to, uh, those are the most recent uh, updates and uh, I'm just going to wrap up uh, the pre-COVID, uh, pre-pandemic milieu uh, experienced by the UCCP. So when uh, uh, the Philippine government declared the lockdown, quarantine lockdown for the entire Luzon Island in, uh, in March, I think it was mid-March. Um, churches also were closed down. They were not allowed to have physical uh, religious services. And uh, the entire Metro Manila, the National Capital Region, uh, transportation system were shut down. Um, people were not allowed to work. And only um, grocery stores are open for people to buy their food. So, it took uh, March, April, April, May, June, until I think June or July um, when the quarantine uh, lockdown was eased. Uh, when slowly uh, the government was trying to ease when even uh, with the increase of number of cases of COVID-19 in the country, they tried to ease uh, the quarantine lockdown. So prior to uh, uh, March 16, uh, UCCP was uh, very stable in terms of its finances and the programs were running smoothly. Uh, although there were some legislative agenda that uh, the UCCP has to pursue in the light of its property development program, um, they were able to carry out uh, what was needed in order to pursue the property development program that will provide the church with sustainable uh, economic support uh, within itself uh, from uh, its uh, institutions and uh, the wider mission support. As we can see, the, uh, the wider mission support of the church was averaging at 1.3 million pesos on a monthly basis until the end of February of 2020. And during the lockdown, uh, it deep into something like 300,000 pesos only a month. And that's uh, too low for maintaining, you know, uh, salaries of staff and uh, operating programs, uh, depending on the, on the programs that, implemented, that are being implemented in the jurisdictions and conferences. So uh, it looks like the 300,000 pesos, well, a little bit more, uh, would not be able to sustain the church uh, during the lockdown period. But luckily, um, our property development programs were able to provide 
uh, sources, new sources of funds to to run uh, the business of the church, uh, ministries and missions, uh, mission of the church in various areas. So as you can see here on this slide, um, uh, there were meetings to address uh, the economy of the church, uh, especially uh, approving uh, legislative agenda on property development. Many of these meetings were geared towards finding means and strategies to address the issues on property development that gave rise to some legal cases. So that's uh, prior to uh, March, middle of March. So we were able to find solutions to pay uh, the loans that we have uh, by means of getting into a joint venture with the different uh, uh, institutions in the country. We were able to establish a very good partnership with Apple One Properties Incorporated to to ease the financial burden of the church. So these are a uh, very specific uh, update on the CCP objectives and its performance, but I'm going to go to slide uh, on the impact of COVID-19, which is slide 122. So we did a lot of uh, regular programming uh, in the church, in the entire United Church, uh, during the months prior to the pandemic. And you can, you can share this to United Church of Canada if you need to look into the details of this uh, programs of the United Church of Christ in the Philippines. So one of the responses of the UCCP to uh, the lockdown, the stoppage of worship services is to encourage uh, our local churches to hold uh, virtual or uh, internet worship services. Uh, but many of the churches that are located in the rural areas could not have the technology to to hold their virtual worship services. Only those in towns and cities that have internet connection were able to uh, conduct their worship services virtually on the internet. So the programs uh, went very well. Uh, carrying out the different facets of the Christian ministry at the national and conference level. We were able to uh, document uh, the different programs for uh, the church workers. 
especially the, the training that we have conducted, uh, which the United Church of Canada has been helping fund. Then with uh, partners, uh, overseas partners, also we were able to carry out uh, educational programs for the church workers and uh, a production of uh, materials, literature materials for uh, the local churches. And of course, we continue to uh, connect with our partners, uh, especially with uh, overseas partners, uh, updating them of uh, the different programs that we have supported in the uh, national and uh, uh, conference level programs. We have ecumenical partners working with us, uh, Reverend Kathy Chang from Presbyterian Church USA. Uh, with her family and we have Andrew Larson from the Global Ministries of UCC uh, and uh, Disciples USA. And we have uh, personal overseas. We have uh, Pastor Noel Suministrado uh, under the mutual recognition of church workers with United Church of Canada. Uh, Pastor Galang Jr. with the PCK, uh, Reverend Frederick Carmelo, uh, who is in Dubai and UAE, Reverend Dr. Dennis Solon with, and Reverend Homer Distaho with United Evangelical Mission. And we have UEM faculty at Suleiman University School, Divinity School who are helping in the teaching ministry of the church for uh, raising church workers and pastors. So you can see uh, in passing some of our uh, stewardship development program from uh, property development that we have in order to sustain the life and ministry of the United Church of Christ and the Philippines. And uh, these recommendations were all approved by the National Council that was held uh, uh, in July of this year. So local churches could not hold their regular services during the pandemic. So many of the UCCP local churches that have internet access and as a technology uh, necessary for video and recording of live streaming of prayer time and worship services were able to uh, go online in terms of their religious services. Uh, other faith communities uh, have initiated house worship and use live broadcasts or recorded video meditations on social media. Many conferences around the country have initiated as well their food relief packs distribution. So aside from the nationally coordinated relief program, our jurisdictions and conferences also uh, were able to deliver uh, food packs and economic support to pastors and communities that are in dire need of food and resources. Also, UCCP hospitals have volunteered to government department of the government's Department of Health to provide hospital rooms for treatment of persons under observation of COVID-19 infection.
the community ministries of the UCCP National Secretariat distributed the second round of relief food packs uh, for uh, communities in the national capital region that were in need of uh, support. And we uh, have the plan to come up with a life-sustaining solidarity fund uh, in case there will be um, calamities like the health uh, pandemic that we have. The church should keep updated and reliable research pertaining to various contagious diseases like COVID-19, SARS, HIV, and other viruses and chemicals used by global military installations in uh, biochemical warfare. We have uh, not all informations have been uh, disclosed to the world, especially to the churches, why we're having this kind of diseases. And this a dirt of information, uh, reliable information, especially in the Philippines, uh, where we can make plans, you know, and uh, uh, initiate programs that will mitigate the impact of uh, these uh, contagious diseases and pandemic. The church hospitals and health ministry programs at various regions and local communities must be equipped with capability in biochemical and epidemiology research so that they can provide scientific information on epidemic and the pandemic. The church must be able to respond to advocacy work for the rights of the people to be supported by their government. So we have uh, only very few churches, as you can see in the diagram. Uh, we have 2,850 local churches and only 381 were able to hold virtual worship services. So it's uh, too few uh, churches can do their worship services online, given that there is a big gap between access to technology and uh, uh, the economic capability of churches to to go online <clears throat> so it's only about 43.47 percent of the churches were able to go online then uh, i think it was in this was in july or august when churches have reduced re resumed their services in the church sanctuary because there were uh, prohibitions for mass gathering, especially religious gathering. Um, when the government eased the protocols, uh, they allowed uh, churches to resume religious services. But even now, under the uh, uh, general community quarantine, only 30% of the sitting capacity of churches uh, can be occupied during religious services. So it's not total uh, opening of the churches yet. Uh, as mandated by the government. So we also have these church workers affected by the pandemic that 53.89% uh, only have done their job on a full-time basis because many of them could not you know, do their work because people are afraid to go back to uh, the church and therefore they have uh, uh, some kind of part-time job in the church because of the pandemic. So as you can see here, May, June, July, uh, churches that resume face-to-face -face worship services in the different jurisdictions. <clears throat> so the needs of the church, church workers and the local churches are mentioned here, like uh, because of the COVID-19, they need to protect themselves from infection. So you can see here recommendations of distribution of uh, uh, a protection equipment uh, for the church workers when they do their uh, pastoral ministry, especially uh, uh, hospitals where our pastors are rendering uh, chaplaincy services to the patients. And there's a great need for improving their connectivity by providing them uh, the necessary technology in remote uh, churches in the country. There were also church workers who were not able to receive their uh, honorarium or regular salaries because of the stoppage of 
uh, religious services in the churches. Yeah, so there is so much uh, need for protection of health and supporting the health needs of our churches, of our communities, and especially the pastors. Um, but uh, during this uh, early, uh, early part of the ecclesiastical year, uh, last year and this year, we have already subsidized um, the salaries of our conference ministers, and we are moving towards uh, standardizing uh, the salaries of church workers in the entire country. So the community ministry of the church were able to conduct, as I mentioned earlier, uh, distribution of food packs. And uh, the national secretariat also was able to provide uh, relief uh, assistance in terms of finances. We were able to release over 5 million pesos to support uh, church workers who do not have, who were not able to receive their salaries or were receiving very low salaries during the pandemic. So uh, uh, many of the church workers that received the support, they said it was uh, very meaningful for them that, the, that during their uh, difficult situation, the UCCP was able to extend financial assistance to them. And we also made uh, relief work in the urban poor communities in Quezon City, where the national office is located. So we have uh, congested communities in uh, urban poor communities in Quezon City, and that's one of the concern of our church to be connected to them and to help them in many ways possible, especially in this time of the pandemic. Also our schools and colleges suffered um, in many parts of the country, especially the Caldera schools. Uh, most of them are uh, mission schools and uh, we interceded with our partners and the global ministries of the UCC and disciples were able to extend assistance to them by providing a sack of rice for all the teachers and staff of our UCCP schools. Yeah, that's uh, yeah, we appreciated the support of our partners overseas. And this is the five million one hundred forty-five thousand pesos that the National Secretariat was able to extend to our uh, church workers who are in difficult situations. So we thank all of you. Uh, that's the uh, shortest way of presenting to you the updates from the United Church of Christ in the Philippines. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Reverend Frank, for that uh, very concise <laughs> and detailed presentation. I hope you will send to me that full PowerPoint presentation sure. because there are some things I was seeing which I think we will be interested in as, right. uh, as okay. UCC. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Yeah, Thank, you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, friends, we just have an interlude of a song. I will ask... Um, uh, Carla to to play for us uh, one solidarity song before we move on to the bishops. And I've been given three songs at this point. <laughs> so the very last one, the one that has just come now. Let's have the children in our gathering. <laughs> that one. Okay, that was a different one. That was, that was actually another song that came in since then, but I love that one. Okay, we can listen to songs for the next 20 minutes based on what we <laughs> <laughs> okay. just, just the latest one. Yeah, great. A morning school property. Okay, next two plus seven. Okay. Nine. Nine. Do 
indeed thank you for those children please if you have questions you can already type them in the chat box so that you do not forget them uh, questions for reverend frank and the united church of christ in the philippines and all the amount of work that they are doing but also the challenges that uh, they shared with us put them in the chat box and we will come back to those questions now it's an opportunity for us to listen to the ecumenical bishops forum and uh, Ate Ofo will uh, present to us, and that is the PowerPoint color that you have from the Ecumenical Bishops Forum. Ate Ofo, are you there? Yes. Don't Please go ahead. Yeah, um, first of all, I would like to uh, say good morning to everyone. And I would like, first of all, to uh, express on behalf of the member bishops of the Ecumenical Bishops Forum for uh, the United Church of Canada, who has been there supporting uh, the EBF since day one with uh, Founding. Um, Carla, can we proceed to uh, a photo where the five founders are uh, being shown? I'm sorry that uh, I have to touch you for this. Yeah, uh, so that um, I can only take five minutes. 
for the for sharing the update and Bishop Rex will articulate it for about 25 minutes. Hmm. Sorry, is it the second slide you want to show or you said there's a slide with five founders? Uh, can I uh, just do it or? Yeah, just go ahead. <laughs> okay, sorry, sorry, sorry. Oh my God. Um, it's uh, here, somewhere here. Let me it down. Oh, there you are. So what I was just uh, saying is that these are the founders of uh, EBF. As you can see, uh, membership of uh, in the forum is uh, purely invitation. And these five founders, um, two are still alive, Bishop Erme Kamba and Bishop Roman Tiples, though they're old already, and three have gone back to their creator. Um, the original five bishops um, invited or inspires the member bishop up to this very first day. Uh, to become um, members of the EBF. But the criteria must be, they must be ardent Filipino nationalists who have faithful uh, support and strong solidarity with the struggle of the Filipino masses for justice, peace, and human rights against Marcus, Marcus dictatorship and up to this very first day, against the Duterte dictatorship. So um, these are the founders uh, that continues to inspire our bishops. Mm -hmm. Paano ba ito? Uh, forward. Wait a minute. So in 2017, um, the member bishops uh, came together for a strategic planning and they came, they came up with this vision to transform Philippine society where peace, justice, and freedom reign and sovereignty asserted and uh, respected. And then their mission is a fellowship of nationalist, progressive, pro-people bishops, EBF commits itself to being a prophetic witness by meaningfully participating in the whole process of joining with listening, articulating, amplifying, and living out its faith in the context of the people's struggle towards a transformed society, uh, and it has been said a while ago. Yeah. Um, they have also set some goals. One is to strengthen and consolidate the membership of EBF in fulfilling its mission. And then sustain solidarity with the marginalized sectors of society and other like groups working with, they, work, they are working with, and then enlighten the institutional churches to the side of the marginalized and oppressed masses. And then the fourth one is increase meaningful involvement of the churches to live and minister in solidarity with the struggling people. And then the fifth one is promote, preserve, and defend the integrity of God's creation towards sustainable development. And then its program um, are the following, education, advocacy, accompaniment, or ecumenical involvement through immersion, protection, living together, and then the organizational capability and capacity building of its member bishop. Then that's uh, one um, very uh, good photo that will, you know, uh, show the image of how our bishops from uh, us being the ecumenical, uh, works with the masses. Then um, maybe 10 years ago, this 
peace is already in their, not 10 years ago, from the very beginning, peace is already in their hearts. So they keep holding on um, their uh, commitment to uphold human rights in the context of the struggle for genuine and lasting peace. And then uh, we have MICA's call. It's some kind of a promotion for EBF. And uh, of course, uh, PEACE is one of our uh, programs. Here. And if you talk about PEACE, um, we are uh, happy to share that EBF is also the secretariat aside from our administrative banner, Mervin Tokero, <laughs> uh, for the PEPP in the continuing dialogue for peace talk between the Philippine government and the National Democratic Front. Uh, by the way, Mervin is uh, not coming in as an individual um, co-worker, but he is coming in as uh, the representative of the National Council of Churches in the Philippines. And then here are um, some of the programs that EBF has been doing and is still been doing uh, up to this very day. Like for instance, uh, as Mervyn and Bishop Fewell uh, showed some slides yesterday and um, EBF was um, also quoted uh, from uh, the statements uh, our uh, Bishop Rex has uh, uh, issued and our officers. Um, just to mention a few of its programs, um, up to this very day, um, EBF is still working with the uh, um, people um, concerning uh, the mining destruction in our country. And in this um, left side where you can see the banner of uh, EBF, this uh, was um, a training workshop of the Ecumenical Bishops Forum in South Luzon uh, that was uh, maybe 15 years ago. But as you can see on the right side, uh, last year only, we, um, the Ecumenical Bishops Forum of North Luzon, through the leadership of uh, Bishop Joseph Agpawa, um, gathered all the b member bishops to come together and uh, um, visit the DPO where the Oceana Gold uh, is located and um, immerse with the people there. But uh, prior to that, they have this uh, some kind of a regional workshop on uh, ecological justice. And these are just uh, one of the photos that up to this very day they do. Um, especially when they are um, participating in protest rallies. And this one is the 25th EBF National Assembly in 2018. Um, the, the, in that General Assembly, they decided that it will become quadrennium. If they come to uh, an assembly, it will be quadrennium. So, so that uh, for the next, for next year or maybe the next year to come, they will gather again together for an assembly. So this is the place where um, the bishop of uh, the diocese of San Jose City, Reve Ecija, became a member of the Ecumenical Bishops Forum. And then some updates. This is uh, very new. Um, from the regions. As you can see, there are seven uh, EBF regional fellowships that uh, EBF has uh, drawn from way back. And um, they had some activities in Baguio City, 
of course, our very own Bishop Liwell Marigsa and Bishop Joseph Agpawa and Bishop Elorde Sambad are helping together to um, bring in together our member bishops there, ecumenical bishops, to, for a gathering. And the first one that they did um, last year, actually they come together for an annual gathering just to you know, uh, have this workshop, regional workshops, either for ecological justice and uh, peace and other um, issues. Um, that was in La Union, and then the next, the other one is was in Baguio, and the third one was in Pontoc Mountain Province, where a a Roman Catholic bishop was. Uh, the host. And then in Middle Zone, um, they are actually more, most of them are in um, the National Capital Region. And you know how busy they are. And so shortly after the National Assembly, they, they come together again to plan uh, and support the people's struggle. And some of them became conveners of different formish, formations uh, up to this very day. And then in South Luzon, um, up to this day, they actively participating in people's struggle uh, from bunkalan or collective farming to community reflections and visit to political prisoners. The last one was uh, a visit to Reverend uh, Dan San Andres, uh, where he was um, arrested and uh, charged uh, with trump up charges together with the General Secretary of Gabriela in Vic. So it's good that he's out in prison right now, but the case is, is still there. And then they had this caravan uh, last year also, that was in August, um, almost 10 of them came together, together with um, priests, pastors, uh, and uh, lay workers of the different churches in uh, South Luzon. Uh, they came together for a caravan and uh, met with Mangyans who are victims of militarization. And then one of the uh, issues that they are acti actively participating in right now is the building of uh, Kaliwa and Kanan Dam. These are the dams that um, the Filipino capitalists like Villar is very interested to because he can um, use and manage the natural resources which is supposed to be for the people. And then uh, in Western, Western Visayas also, they come together for a regular meeting. They held dialogues with victims of militarization and families of extrajudicial um, killings. And they conducted ecumenical walk. And some of the activities actually are, uh, they are engaged with, uh, and they are engaged with our um, activities wherein they can uh, walk together with the people's needs. And then this one, since um, 2017 or so, uh, as we have heard, we have bishops who are being red tagged. Uh, Bishop Antonio Ablon, who is now based in uh, Europe. Then Bishop Kalang, who is being vilified together with some of their priests. Bishop Rex, he was also a uh, red tag. Bishop Ewell, and then Obispo Maximo Ri Timbang, and then the latest one was Bishop Hamuel Tekis of the Pau. Despite that, they still continue regular uh, workshops on ecological justice and peace and other issues. 
And then, uh, what is good to this day, um, the regional fellowships uh, has uh, organized four, four leaders, around three to four of them, so that they can um, sit down together and uh, discuss before they invite the other bishops to come in for uh, a planning activity. And uh, the National Secretariat is always invited um, in the person of our General Secretary because we have a General Secretary in the person of uh, Bishop Joel Tendero. Carla, can you help me? Yeah, right now it's the Southeast uh, Mindan uh, uh, Madana. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, right? thank you. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> all right. These are the, the, the situation actually in uh, Southeast uh, Mindanao. Of course, um, last year or so, the closure of uh, the Lumad schools, teachers are being red tagged, forced evacuation, and food blockade. This forced evacuation we experienced in 2018, that was in between June and July. We were there, some of our bishops in Mindanao and the secretariat were there and we saw and see and feel what is to be evacuated or evacuated. It's hard. And then also one of the issues is the, sorry, AFP custodial activity on the uh, Lumad Minals and in Angat Valley and Pantaran Range, it is highly militarized up to this very day. Mm. Can you help? Me? Uh, okay. Yeah, the ecotourism sure. also. Yeah. Thank you. Political landscape, selling of shorelines, and tourism potential areas in disguise of ecotourism. As you uh, may know, um, only the rich and the capitalists in, co in cahoots with the foreign investors can own a, a shoreline or a, what do you call that, resort or a beach in the Philippines. And then land grabbing um, continues, of course, by uh, influential political clans and figures especially in the islands. And then, yeah, mining work. And then the situation of the workers. 75% of workers are contractual and seasonal basis, underpaid or beyond minimum wage. Competition and labeling between small and big scale mining. And then of course, uh, there is always militarization and human rights violation. There is uh, the Sapercidos, uh, aside from that massive militarization, uh, one of the, our friends has been missing a year ago. See, Hani Mai, most of us know her. Hani Mai is a human rights defender who was missing since November 2. And then massive recruitment of military and tactics. The latest attacks on Lumad School that led to the Talaing Road 18, and then the arrest and trump up charges of um, Lumad teachers and supporters. Sorry, this has been said. Then action taken. Uh, relief delivery to the Lumad communities, Lumad accompaniment through designated areas, Lumad immersion in the evacuation center. There is workers assistance program, interchurch conference on social justice, observance of international solidarity. Um, and then in Eastern Visayas, conducted different activities in some related area with the National Council of Churches in the Philippines. And also they joined the people's action against tyranny. And then what has been done in 2018-2019? Uh, 
These are the following peacemaking through the uh, education and nurture for ecumenical advocacy, human rights, and ecological justice. The next, and then in July 2019 to December 2019, a two and a half day North Luzon workshop on peace and ecological justice was held last September 23 and 25. And then it was held in Vizcaya. In here, they also invited um, the provincial governor, who is a an anti, a fellow anti um, mining also advocate. So they were able to get him in in the regional workshop and spoke in there. And um, he also talked about. Um, the resumption of the peace talks that it is also one of his prayers that it would resume. And then after that, they went to a an immersion to the DPO Cebu. And then the second one was in Northwest. To show some pictures, but maybe in the reports that uh, I will send to Joseph. Now my internet connection is unstable. Carla, please. Yeah, we lost you for a bit, but we got you back. Oh, really? Sorry, sorry. It's okay. And we're, it's, this is the Caravan for Peace and Human Rights. Yeah, that's uh, it's what I'm, I was talking about a while ago. This was held in Southern Luzon. Um, and then the year 2020 made a part EBF made a partnership with CDCP Episcopal Commission and Ecumenical Affairs into the religious dialogue and indigenous peoples. With EBF is also the National Council of Churches in the Philippines. And then um, two big webinar events was held with them uh, last September 7 because of this season of creation that uh, is um, organized by the global Catholic climate movement. And so they invited us, EBF and NCCP, to become uh, active participants in this uh, season of creation. So we thought of coming um, up with um, a webinar called Ecumenism in the Grassroots Level. So we held this one in September 20. September 7, 2020, and in the Zoom, there were about 100 participants, but in that actual day, there were about um, 7,000 attendees in live Facebook streaming. So now, because people are interested, what is uh, ecumenism is all about, especially in, um, in the group of uh, the Roman Catholic churches, Roman Catholic Church, it's now about 12,000. Uh, you may um, visit that from the Facebook of the Global Catholic Climate Movement. And then on September 15, um, spirituality, the second one was spirituality of human rights and environmental defenders. And we also had uh, EBF regional fellowships uh, they also launched forums on anti-terror law, which is a hot issue here in the Philippines, the death penalty, and also we continue to call for the resumption of the peace talks, even if the path is rough. And then this is just an image where the EBF and NCCP and the bishops um, of, from the Catholic uh, have uh, come together for a meeting in preparation of those uh, of uh, the year of ecumenism and also um, in preparation for the 500 years celebration for Christianity. Oh, so it's High time for Bishop Rex to come in and articulate what has been shared. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much, Ateofo. Uh, Bishop Rex, you have five minutes. She took a lot of your time. <laughs> yes, uh, thank you. Uh, first, uh, let me, let me uh, convey my personal greetings to Michael Blair, in your assumption as the General Secretary of the United Church. Uh, second, uh, I must uh, emphasize uh, how the church has endured all these years. Uh, I, I think this is a, a profound appreciation and uh, understanding by the United Church of Canada, not only of the incarnation, not only of ecumenism, but also of Christian solidarity. Uh, so after the presentation of uh, Ophel, the question remains, in the existence or the preponderance of so many, many ecumenical formations, what will you need an ecumenical bishop for? In other words, uh, uh, since 1983, uh, do we need an ecumenical bishop's for? The answer is most definitely yes. Uh, not only because I was one of its former secretariat and now uh, one of its uh, member bishops, but also because of the historical circumstances which gave birth to the ecumenical bishops. It, gave, it was uh, born at a time of the deep fascist uh, uh, situation where the dictator uh, was really uh, spiraling to the end by its own doing and by a galvanized uh, people's action uh, all the way from north to uh, Luzon to Mindanao. Uh, Mervyn yesterday mentioned uh, a word that uh, continues to give flesh to, to how the Ecumenical Bishops Forum understands itself. Uh, he used the term accompaniment. Uh, and uh, that, that's the first word that, uh, that makes uh, the Ecumenical Bishops Forum uh, important. And the second one is uh, education. Bishops need to be educated too. Uh, they may have all the, whatever you call uh, the, the theological language, but if they don't have the people, uh, what's a bishop for? Uh, the classic definition is that where the church is, where the bishop is, that is where the church is. Uh, we are proving in the Philippines that that's a very, very narrow understanding of what a bishop is. Uh, uh, so uh, how is this accompaniment and uh, education best understood and contextualized? In the experience of the uh, Ecumenical Bishops Forum, as you may have seen, it is clear that those in pain are the ones shouting. In other words, uh, well, rarely do you see uh, people who are happy or contented uh, making a lot of noise. Uh, although it says make a joyful music to the Lord, uh, that's a biblical language, but in the, in the reality, in the real sense of the word, uh, in a situation uh, like we have here in the Philippines, uh, it is the people who are in pain who are shouting. And those who are not in pain uh, seem to be doing the other way around. They either kill them or uh, vilify them or uh, would like to make them disappear from from uh, the, the second thing that I would like to mention is that unless people speak, we are literally sheep without a shepherd. Uh, I think that's the main point of why bishops have to be there. Bishops have to learn and bishops have to study and uh, uh, in, in the, uh, which is related to the third point that I would like to emphasize. In this country and anywhere in the world, I think, faith is now under siege, expressed in the way they vilify bishops, church people, uh, and not just vilify them, but uh, after speaking to a forum in Baguio uh, last February, 
A week later, a record sent me a photograph of myself. Uh, behind me was a person uh, with the uh, horns, like, like the caricature of Satan. And it's the same, uh, it's the same, uh, uh, it's the same group that red tagged uh, uh, Bishop Marixa. I have kept that photograph uh, like a red badge of curry of honor or something like that. Uh, but it, it's it's a good to be reminded of how much, how how what has to, uh, how far one person can go uh, for those things. Uh, uh, I'm not going to share that photograph on Facebook. It has already been shared. I, I captured it, so uh, it's in my keeping. Uh, when faith is under siege, I remember one of the founders of the Ecumenical Bishops Forum. Uh, Bishop Labayan uh, saying, the bishops are not just to teach the faith, they are supposed to defend it. And at times like this, the, the, the bishops are supposed to articulate the defense in, in, uh, uh, in the perspective, from the perspective of faith. Uh, fourth, the world has become hostile to leftist opinions. It has become incapable of respecting other opinions except its own, except the language of those in power and those who are, who dominate. Uh, all over the world, you go to uh, the United Kingdom and you can see people becoming less and less tolerant, equating socialists, leftists, or those who hold a different political opinion as uh, uh, fascists or, or communists or something, godless or something like that. So, so the language in this world uh, today has become terrible that affects uh, human relations, that breaks empathy, that collapses all sort of solidarity, and which are precisely the reasons why we must continue to exist. Finally, uh, we are faced today with two very critical areas that we need to work on uh, from even from the perspective of church people. But specifically for, for the bishops, I think the, the, these two issues are a primary concern. First is the existence of false narratives the, the latest attempt to destroy the uh, memorial in, uh, uh, along the Kalinga Highway of uh, Maklin Bulag is a particular case in point to a, a case of historical revisionist tendencies. Uh, the case to trump up President Marcos as the best thing that ever happened to this country and uh, to even liken uh, the current tenant in Malacanang is of the same mold. It's a terrible indication of how far people would like to revise history to suit political agenda. Uh, the second uh, issue is this conspiracy theories leading to a number of deaths, killings, imprisonments, illegal arrests, all on the basis of conspiracy. And uh, in, in our country, as you may have heard already from the presentation here, uh, one is can be accused by guilt, by, 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 uh, by uh, association. Uh, by, uh, you can, I can be associated with uh, Wendell and I'm already uh, uh, Wendell in, uh, in person. He is the Wendell in Luzon and I'm the Wendell, you know, that kind of associating things with uh, with uh, everything. So these false narratives and conspiracy theories have uh, led us to a terrible situation of false news, fake news. And, and uh, most of us church people are now faced with the reality of having to deal with responding to the questions of falsehood uh, 
at this time. So those are the reasons why I think as a, uh, as a co-convener of the Ecumenical Bishops Forum, why we need to exist. And uh, we thank you for the space for this conversation. Thank you, Jaffe. Thank you very much, Bishop Rex, raising very important issues there. I had just uh, been writing when Ate Ofo was uh, presenting you know, as to why do we need the Ecumenical Bishops Forum when we have other ecumenical configurations like the National Council of Churches? <laughs> and you just answered it. Thank you very much, Bishop Rex, for that. Uh, friends, I uh, will invite us now to just take um, a health break for five minutes. Ang awaiting a call for help ay naisulat ko pagkatapos ng Bagyong Yolanda. Ito ay isang awitin na nagpapayag ng isang panawagan ng tulong, ng pagkalinga, at paano maaalalayan ang ating mga kapatid na apektado sa dilubyong iyon. Ito, a call for help.
Greetings from the Cordillera. I am supposed to be with my team of volunteers, but only Pastor William Mariano is with us. Pastor Virgilio Aniceto can't make it since they are on hard lockdown due to rising cases of COVID-19 in the mining areas. The Regional Ecumenical Council in the Cordillera started the year with high hopes that we could engage the different church formations in their prophetic mission as we join it together in solidarity with the struggles and aspirations of the indigenous peoples and the Filipinos in general. This is our ecumenical call and response in these trying times. In the Cordillera region, indigenous peoples are under attack and so with the different sectors and organizations advocating the issues of the people as mentioned already by CPA yesterday. As an ecumenical formation in the region, we are being challenged to express in concrete terms our united stance on the many issues affecting our people. The implementation of the whole of nation approach by government has not only targeted what they suspected as leftists and communists and communist front organizations and individuals, but as well as legitimate non-government organizations and institutions. Advocates and service providers are already scared because of red tagging, vilification, filing of trump up charges, and becoming an open target of the government just because of our association with indigenous people's organizations asserting their right to self-determination and genuine democracy. With the attacks against legitimate organizations and advocates of people's issues, the church is not spared and so we have to stand our ground. This is the face of church persecution for proclaiming the good news and denouncing evil are understood as going against the existing order and they want to silence dissent. Our programs and advocacies for the least, the lost, and the last among our people are our acts of compassion in providing the temporal needs of the people. We accompany the people in asserting their basic rights, demand justice, and pursue peace. This is our calling, this is our ecumenical calling as a church. As an ecumenical council in the Cordillera, we have to accept the reality. We have to accept the reality that most of our staffs are on voluntary status. We have still that spirit of volunteerism among church people. That is why even if we seem to be like a skeletal force in the office, we have a network of committed church workers who are willing to help anytime when it is needed. This year, our cashier clerk filed an early retirement because of health issues. She had already lingering health problem, problem when she joined the record in 2016 and it continued to affect her health and her, her work-related tasks. She wrote the council about her health and resignation, which was accepted during the regular meeting. And because we don't want to the, our work to stop, and so we recommended Pastor Virgilio Aniceto to be part of the staff of record as volunteer. Luckily for us, we were able to have a regular council meeting on March 9, 
where we reported our 2019 accomplishment report and our fund activities for 2020. We started our activities this year by joining and supporting activities implemented in the region and activities that are ecumenical in nature. We participated in the week of Christian for in the week of prayer for Christian unity, the annual fellowship of the United Church Workers Organization of North Luzon Jurisdiction, the regional founding assembly of the One Faith One Nation One Voice, the One Billion Rising, and the International Working Women's Day celebration, to name a few. We were even preparing for the interseminary summer exposure program and the participation of church people in the Cordillera Day celebration when this was cut by the announcement of the enhanced community quarantine for the island of Luzon to contain the spread of the coronavirus. The One Faith, One Nation, One Voice Cordillera was formed on February 19, 2020 at the Catholic Renewal Center, Bishop's House, Baguio City in response to the call to form a movement of church people in these trying times. Participants were from the Roman Catholic Church, member churches of the National Council of Churches in the Philippines, Association of Women Religious in Baguio Benguet, the Ecumenical Bishops Forum, and the lay sectoral organizations. We were able to elect the regional officers and sad to say, that they have not met yet until now because of the health protocols of social distancing and no social gathering. This is the ecumenism at the grassroots level where different churches could come together, learn and discern what God is trying to tell to his people in these trying times. We want to draw the participation of the conservative, charismatic, Pentecostal, and evangelical groups in the Cordillera on what we can do as a church to help alleviate the plight of the indigenous peoples and to encourage church people to advocate the indigenous people's issues. For us at record, we have a difficulty of coming together for a formal meeting in order to plan for what we could do and contribute as a council to the present crisis. We want to do more aside from our unceasing prayers for this COVID-19 pandemic to end. We know of churches soliciting support for church workers who have not received their honorarium during the past, during the first three months of the pandemic. We know that our parishioners are also making both ends meet as they try to figure it out how they could support their families under a no work, no pay situation. The support from the government is not enough and so people are restless. One of our joys is that there are few cases of COVID-19 in the region, but with the relaxation of the health protocols, there was a sudden spike of cases through local transmissions. Overseas Filipino workers might bring home the virus now that they are coming home because they were terminated from work. Companies have closed their operations are because of lockdown. People have to shift from their original work and look for other opportunities during this pandemic. The sad part for most of the churches is that the health protocols affected the regular services they are used to. Starting March of this year, church services were suspended during the enhanced community quarantine that lasted for several, several months. There were no income for the churches and some of its programs were suspended. There were no income it is so hard for Filipinos to imagine without the physical presence of family members and relatives during baptism, death, marriage, and other family and clan gatherings. The saddest part is when there are deaths, they have to be buried immediately as part of protocol. 
others were able to do funeral services via Zoom. And it pains us to see grieving families who could not gather physically, but to pay their last respects from a distance. We don't know how the churches and members are going through in this time of pandemic since we cannot talk with them except with the church workers. We only know in general that they are doing everything to stretch whatever savings they have since their source of income had been affected by health crisis. The social amelioration program of government cannot provide for all of those affected by the impact of the COVID-19. It was only for poor families who are earning less, but even the middle class are also affected with their companies and businesses closing down. Even the farmers in the Cordillera who are producing essential goods for the nation cannot sell their produce because there are no middlemen to buy their goods or because of the lockdown that the demand is not the same as before when the tourism industry was at its peak. Upland vegetable growers are also letting their vegetables their harvest to decompose in their fields since the prices are so low. We have not seen the different government agencies coming together to help people recover from their loss of income, giving economic packages for businesses closing down, worsening unemployment and mental health problems created by this pandemic. People are depressed, stressed, deprived, and longing for sudden turnaround of events that will never come. With this kind of situation, we have to prepare for the future since this health crisis will be recurring now and then. The way we do business now and in the future have changed already and it continues to evolve. We have to adapt to new reality and new way of thinking and engaging with the future. For a people-oriented organization like us, we need to find ways and become creative in social gatherings. As for the network of NGOs in the Cordillera, we are pulling our resources to contribute to the relief operations and socioeconomic activities for the vulnerable communities in the Cordillera and in addressing the continuing threat, harassment, red tagging, and human rights violations among people's organizations and institutions working in solidarity with the people as mentioned earlier by CPA. Second half of the year, church people started to participate in the different activities like the webinar on the passage of the anti-terrorist terrorism law. and on the COVID-19 pandemic response during the State of the Nation Address in July. The ecumenical prayer of the different sectors was even attacked in social media as leftist activity by an army of trolls. They want to demonize the different organizations by red tagging them. We also joined in the Defend for the DRA PH campaign, which was launched recent, recently, as mentioned by CPA. The issue of the demolition of the sacred heroes monument in Book Night in Lion Kalinga is another form of attack against CPA and the indigenous people's struggle for their right to self-determination and ancestral domain. We have encouraged the different denominations to make statements of support for the indigenous peoples this is our continuing commitment to be of service to the marginalized sectors. UCCP in North Luzon jurisdiction and the Episcopal Church in the Philippines came up with their denominational statement of support. On September 21, 2020, church people joined the different sectors through blended physical gathering and webinar in commemorating the 48th year of martial law, where we remember the atrocities of Marcos then and the de facto martial law now under Duterte. Our people have suffered and are suffering the same inhumanity and the vested interest of the ruling elite to stay in power. Bishop Riwell Marigza was one of the speakers 
and he mentioned that the prospects of peace in the country is still through the formal peace talks between the National Democratic Front of the Philippines and the government of the Republic of the Philippines, which was terminated. The government opted for militarist approach in solving the fundamental problems of the Philippine society. We also celebrated the Indigenous Peoples Month on October 17, which is not the usual intergenerational gathering among our people. The community elders should be present to impart what they know about Indigenous knowledge and practices that have sustained the way of life of the Indigenous peoples. The youth who are supposed to be the bearers of the oral traditions also be there to witness and live out the collective memories of our ancestors into the present world. But with the health protocols, we celebrated online through a blended format. In that way, we were able to gather together virtually. Bishop Ruel Marigsa of NCCP gave the homily on the theme, Churches Unite for Stewardship and Life, while Bishop Victor Bendico of the Roman Catholic Church gave an input on this year of ecumenism, interreligious dialogue, and indigenous peoples. Just recently, on October 28, 2020, during the news briefing of Secretary Eduardo Año of the Department of Interior and Local Government and Secretary Hermogenes Esperon Jr., the National Task Force to End Local Communist Armed Conflict, live on Bombo Radio Philippines Network on the red tagging issue. They used the picture of church people joining a rally in Baguio City as a background. In that news brief briefing, they were trying to make a connection of legitimate organizations with that the Communist Party of the Philippines. That is a little bit scary for those who have committed their lives based on what they believe is in as mandated by faith. Like the women celebrities in the Philippines, whose passion is to help the needy, advocate their issues and support their causes, were wrongfully accused or red tagged as having an association with suspected communist fronts. They are using the social media to harass, red tag, and vilify whom they think are against the government instead of coming up with concrete evidence that they could use in the proper forum. With what is happening now, we have to adapt with the new reality because this health crisis has changed the way we are going to relate with each other conduct our programs and implement our activities and in using the social media platform as a new arena for our work. We look forward in conducting webinars and Zoom meetings, but we have problems with our telecommunication companies with slow connectivity and the need to upgrade internet connection. We also need to upgrade our internet connection in the office. We have to continue with our mission and ministry based on our Christian mandate to work for the transformation of church and society. We have to strengthen our coordination efforts with the different sectors, organizations, and institutions that have the same campaign, advocacy, and agenda in supporting the most vulnerable sectors, particularly the indigenous peoples. We have to work together in opposing and exposing the evils around us in partnership with peace-loving Filipinos, human rights advocates, people's organizations, and institutions. Let us unite as a people in pursuing peace based on justice to heal the nation from destruction and decay. We have to engage the different churches to learn and understand societal issues and participate and in whatever capacity they can as advocates of the indigenous people's issues in particular and the fundamental problems in Philippine society in general. Thank you and abuhay.
Thank you very much, um, Marika, for that presentation of the Regional Ecumenical Organization in the Cordrela and what you are doing in that part of the world. Thank you, thank you. Salama, Paul. Please hold on to your questions and your comments as we now turn to the National Council of Churches update and uh, Aseli will be doing that presentation on behalf of the National Council of Churches and she will call upon whoever she wants to call upon to support her in the presentation. Um, thank you, uh, Dr. Jaffet. Good morning, everyone. Um, so I will be presenting today the highlights of uh, the accomplishment of uh, the two programs supported by uh, the United Church of Christ Canada, uh, which is uh, the women's program, uh, women's capacity building and ecumenical leadership formation, and the, the human rights program. Uh, the current global pandemic uh, has not only affected the health of Filipinos, but also worsened social and protection problems. The government's militaristic approach to the crisis exacerbated domestic violence, sexual exploitation, and human rights violations, among many others. It has unraveled lingering social inequalities and has further deepened economic misery in the country. Attacks against people's fundamental rights have been intensifying every day, leading to the passing of the Anti-Terrorism Act of 2020. With a new act in place, these human rights violations have continued at an unabated rate, and churches and church people have not been spared. Red tagging became rampant. Not only was the NCCP red tagged, but also the very people that work behind the council. Smear campaigns against progressive organizations and churches continue in Mindanao. Posters tagging activists, rights, defend rights defenders, and church people as human rights violators, and Bredugo, and, at pumapatay ng katutubo or killers to extinguish tribes, were circulated in the Vow City. And um, the people who were tagged included activists and leaders who work with limited communities, including Bishop Hamuel Tekis, a UCCP bishop known for his ministry and sanctuary program of Haran for the displaced Lumad communities in Mindanao. Indeed, the crisis is getting worse. However, in critical times such as these, uh, the NCCP will continue to journey with the people and we draw inspiration from the resurrected Christ. I will just be sharing uh, a PowerPoint slide to guide me in my presentation. So, um, for the Women's Capacity Building and, Ecum and Ecumenical Leadership Formation, um, last year in November, prior to the NCCP General Convention, Yeah, 31 youth and women delegates uh, gathered for the NCCP Women and Youth Free Assembly held on November 23, 2019 at the Communication Foundation of Asia. And um, this free assembly provided venues for discussion and reflection on the current realities and pres pressing issues related to the work and ministries of the ecumenical women and youth. Testimonies from women of victim of uh, the government's war on drugs and from a student and teacher from the Lumad Bakri Tevakili School provided the context and struggles of some of the most vulnerable sectors in our society. The challenge posed to the delegates by the pre-assembly is how can the ecumenical women and the young people be dynamically engaged in the continuing struggles of the marginalized sectors and to be and to to deepen its act of solidarity in faithful witness of our Christian faith. 
the statements and resolutions sponsored by the youth and women representatives to the convention um, were approved by, by the general convention, in the, including statements on online sexual exploitation of children and rice liberalization law. For the advocacy uh, activities, About 100 ecumenical women also and men gathered to reflect ponder upon the women's resistance against violence in all its form. And the theme for the gathering is Rise for Justice, Unite for Peace, uh, which is actually, which remains to be one of the urgent concern and call of the ecumenical women. The event coincides with the first year anniversary of the signing of the Rice Liberalization Law. Hence, the ecumenical women representatives present in the gathering Present in the gathering, um, read the NCCP's approved um, statement uh, on on the issue of rice liberalization, and um, the one billion rising is um, actually an annual uh, gathering of uh, the ecumenical women and partners, uh, and it has been a creative form of resistance where women express our solidarity in a global campaign that calls to end violence and exploitation of women. Another is the International Women's Day. Um, this is usually um, uh, in partnership with the Association of Major Religious Superiors in the Philippines. We also hold this annual gathering. And uh, for this year, around 250 women and men gathered in one of the facilities of our Roman Catholic um, sisters. Um, this was actually the last big gathering that we had uh, before uh, the lockdown. Uh, various lectures, reflections, um, discussions on this gathering um, aimed at providing awareness on various issues concerning women and society. And um, the panel discussions uh, were about um, the Human Security Act, peace talks, rights liberalization law, and church attacks. Um, and um, this gathering also continues to be a um, collective work and commitment of churches and organization. And it is both uh, unlearning and learning and a continuing challenge and commitment uh, for us to lift our voice without, without fear. Uh, the program uh, also supports uh, and provides uh, support uh, for the ecumenical women's formation like the Association of Women in Theology General Assembly. This, is, this was held last uh, January, in, uh, which was toasted by uh, the AWIT in Baguio. And of course, we have Pastor Maricar who uh, really helped us uh, in organizing this event. Uh, the program highlighted the struggles of women in the grassroots and their suffering, and the AWIT uh, committed to carry on doing theology that brings empowerment and liber liberation. Um, our, our very own, of course, Pastor Maricar was uh, is, uh, was elected as one of the uh, national co coordinator of AWIT during this general assembly, and um, the AWIT is an organization of women engaged in theology, whether academically trained or working in academic institutions, or doing ecumenical grassroots and practical ministries. And um, NCCP continues to provide organizational and technical support to AWIT. And they have been our very uh, uh, constant partner uh, in terms of a uh, women's program. Next is the ecumenical um, Church Women United in the Philippines and the Asian um, Church Conference Sunday. Um, they held their 72nd General Assembly uh, also last November. Um, members of the Ecumenical Church Women United in the Philippines are nine member, are nine uh, women lay organization uh, from the NCCP members. So the theme for the General Assembly um, 
is uh, my, uh, my Abandoned Life for Your Abundant Life uh, from John 10.10. 10. And um, the General Assembly elected as new officers and uh, Dr. De Dr. Gay Manodon, uh, who is also the NCCP Vice Chairperson, was re-elected as uh, President of ECWUP from 2020 to 2020. Amid the COVID-19 pandemic, a series of webinars were conducted uh, during the lockdown period. Uh, the online discussion on managing stress and anxiety amid the COVID-19 pandemic was held uh, in partnership with the Coalition on Health Action for Human Rights. And also, um, we uh, worked with the council Center for Women's Resources uh, in organizing the webinar Pandemic Tales Untold Stories of Women During Lockdown. And this was spearheaded also by the Voices of Women for Justice and Peace for in NCCP uh, Women's Desi. That's one of the convened. The webinar highlighted stories of migrant women who um, and women organizers in Aita communities, women rights activists, um, who, was, uh, who were arrested while doing community service in Marikina, and also one from a small entrepreneur's in initiative in the midst of lockdown. Uh, moreover, in partnership with the Association of Women and Theology, uh, a forum entitled When Rights Are Wrong uh, was um, organized. And um, Uh, some of the highlights for this uh, webinar are sharings also from um, the women, like uh, the one from Gabriela, uh, who was illegally arrested also during Labor Day while having community kitchen in Marikina, and also uh, from the daughter of a slain activist, Jory Portilla, um, about, who shared about the injustice and impunity on his father's case. Uh, the program also provided um, financial support to the families of Rise Up uh, during the lockdown and um, they facilitated the distribution of food packs to the communities um, during the lockdown period. Safety measures and protocols in coordination with local government units were observed during the relief distribution. Furthermore, um, the campaign stopped Victim blaming was launched in the NCCP Facebook page as part of the First Days in Black campaign. Uh, this campaign was a response to the PNP Lukban Kesson official Facebook account post telling girls not to wear short, uh, then reported them when they are harassed. Likewise, the campaign aimed to promote an end to rape and rape culture. Also, just recently, uh, the hashtag no to red tagging, yes to red lipstick stop the attacks uh, was also launched uh, in partnership uh, with the Association of Women in Theology. Um, Kuya Mervin also has a, a Facebook post. <laughs> I haven't asked his permission to use that. <laughs> so I just uh, choose one from uh, the, the AWIT page. Um, And also, um, I think this is the last for the women's uh, program. Yeah. Uh, in partnership with the Union Theological Seminary, the program offered an online course for women in leadership, leadership roles and to those who serve in church or church-related institutions. Babaylan articulations, expressions, and embodiment um, is aimed at developing a feminist and faith perspective on issues related to gender and sexuality. In this course, the traditional roles of women in church, church and society were interrogated with critical tools of analysis. Hence, these topics were devised uh, for the course. So, um, women in the Bible, women doing theology, women, church, and society, women, and Sochi, and Babaylan articulations and expression workshop. 52 women from various churches and organizations um, participated in the, enrolled in the course, and they have shared daily reflections and creative articulations of women's experiences, influences, and role in the church and society. 
for um, the Human Rights Program. Um, I think yesterday, Mervyn already shared about the NCCP and Equivoice work related to the UN Human Rights Council and international campaign. So I will just um, highlight some of the other rights-based work that NCCP does. Um, the first one is Formation of Churches Witnessing with Migrants. Um, led by the Moro Women Center and um, Migrante General um, Santos. Uh, the first assembly, which was held on November um, last year, uh, gathered 50 participants composed of grassroots communities and migrants, uh, my Muslim and non-Muslim OFWs, indigenous people, and families of OFWs, and uh, migrant-serving organizations and faith communities faith communities, um, representatives from the Islamic faith, uh, from NCCP member churches, and the Christian and Missionary Alliance Churches of the Philippines are come up. For this year's Migrant Sunday, um, a reflection and prayer guide uh, was also developed uh, during the Sunday, uh, for the NCCP churches resource uh, during the Sunday worship um, last March 15. Uh, the guide was prepared by Reverend Kathy Chang of the Presbyterian Church, um, USA, Mississippi, and Mississippi, which contains reflections and prayers from churches and migrants organizations from Luzon, Visayas, and Mindanao, and from around the globe. NCCP uh, continues to support the um, Save the Life of Mary Jane um, campaign, and... Um, the program has been following and supporting the case filed against her recruiters through mobilizing contingents and support um, during the case hearings. The campaign has generated positive results and I would like to uh, mention some. Uh, first, uh, last year in October, the Supreme Court granted the petition to allow Mary Jane to testify via deposition and put the ordeal she went through on judicial Court. And so with this ruling, the advocates are hopeful that the truth will surface and convince the government of Indonesia of her innocence and be free. And then, um, fast forward, uh, uh, however, no, this January 30, 2020, um, Christina Serio and Julius Lacanilao, Lacanilao, Veloces Recruiters, were adjudged by the um, same court uh, as guilty of large-scale uh, illegal recruitment on a case separated filed by other victims. So the result of this trial will greatly bolster the human trafficking case filed by the Veloso that is being tried um, simultaneously by um, the same RTC. And um, also um, in terms of providing solidarity support, uh, to sectoral organization, um, NCCP continues to provide um, solidarity support to um, several, um, uh, to some of the organizations like Union ng Mga Manggagawa sa uh, Agricultura in, in collaboration with the National Federation of Sugar Workers. And the summit was held against uh, the backdrop of the government's plan to further liberalize the importation of sugar and um, small planters from Batangas, Hacienda, Luisita, Interlac, Negros, Cebu, and Ignor. And uh, the result of the activity uh, uh, was the formation of the Tangol Asukal Network. Um, NCCP also supported the launching of the network Save Nueva Vizcaya Movement. Uh, for the, for the national campaign to protect the environment, natural resources, and people's rights in the nationally significant watershed by diverse province in Nueva Vizcaya. In time for the Mine Safety Week, uh, the network staged a public mobilization calling on the government to stop the destructive large mining projects, such as the 12,864 hectare BP copper and gold, uh, gold mine of uh, Oceana Gold. 
The Australian Canadian Transnational Mining Corporation also has a long standing negative track record of violating human rights, including the right to a safe and healthy environment of its affected communities. For the migrants, uh, for uh, uh, in responding to the plight of the Filipino migrant workers, uh, NCCP also through the Faith Witness um, and Service Program released an appeal to churches for service and solidarity for our migrant sisters and brothers. Uh, in particular, the appeal is urging churches to initiate mechanism to respond to OFW's urgent needs such as food, transportation, and shelter, and develop systematic and comprehensive ecumenical and interfaith responses for service advocacy for our stranded OFWs. For the international advocacy, um, there were um, several um, consultations made and also um, webinars uh, like the Faith Communities Working with Migrants Amidst COVID-19 Crisis. The webinar highlighted the conditions of migrants around the world, um, which was presented uh, by um, Annie Lestari of the International Migrants Alliance and also some of um, uh, the organizations, uh, who, uh, partner organizations uh, that NCCP works with in terms of migrant uh, advocacy. And also another webinar uh, held was the Faith Communities um, Standing in Solidarity with Migrants in the Middle East. Uh, there were panels of speakers on the Western East African and Asian context of migration and the parallels between the two continents and why their peoples go to the Middle East. Uh, there were testimonies from an African migrant worker who sur survived human trafficking and an Asian seafarer who was laid off from work and was stuck in quarantine facility after being repatriated. Um, a sharing on the churches witnessing with migrants and its works uh, in relation to global advocacy and collective action was also presented by Reverend Dr. Lev Liberato Bautista of the General Board of Church and Society of the United Methodist Church. Um, for the ecumenical direct services, um, we have uh, the NCCP has provided um, support to um, the families of Mary Jane Veloso um, and also to Miss uh, uh, Elizabeth Kalubad, uh, a member of the Desaparecidos. Uh, other supports given uh, were uh, uh, to the families of the fire victims. Uh, in Avota City, uh, also last year, and about uh, and also to the workers of Eagle Ridge Golf Course in general, uh, Trias Cavite through the Samahan ng Mga Gawa sa Eagle Ridge. Uh, this labor group um, staged a strike uh, last year because of poorly enforced labor codes and for labor-only contractualization. Um, through Karapatan, the NCCP also um, supported the release of um, four human rights defenders in Medes Occidental and um, provided bail funds and legal medical educational assistance uh, to some of our partners and to some individuals. I will not be mentioning names, uh, of course, for um, security purposes, but uh, I think uh, some of the highlights for this um, direct services also was uh, the just recently, uh, the provision of the burial assistance to the family of um, Sara Alvarez. Uh, we all know her, uh, a 39-year-old peasant organizer and human rights defender in the island of Negros. And also to the family of Baby River Nasino, the infant daughter of a 23-year-old rights activist, Reina Ina Nasino. Um, so Ina is uh, an urban poor organizer who no? was also illegal, illegally, illegally arrested um, last year. Um, 
Also, educational assistance uh, was given to children of human rights defenders and also to uh, assistance to victims of uh, uh, abduction and also uh, to a paralegal uh, worker uh, in Mindanao. Uh, I think uh, the picture there, uh, uh, Free Ilo Ilo 42, um, uh, NCCP also uh, extended um, bail funds and support to uh, the 40 act for the activists who were unlawfully arrested on May 1, uh, Labor Day in Iloilo. And um, they were supposed to hold a caravan over the killing of Jory Porquia, who was shot nine, nine times by an identified armed man in his home. And Jory Porquia was a Bayan Mona coordinator in Iloilo. Included in the arrest was um, the IFIP's father, Marco Sulayao, and his daughter, uh, May Sulayao, who is an ecumenical church leader from the IFI and the Kalipunan ng Christian ng Kabataan sa Pilipinas. And also, um, we also supported the peace caravan and the humanitarian response in... Um, Mindoro, led by the Southern Tagalog Region Ecumenical Movement. And the objectives were to support the f and provide humanitarian services for the indigenous communities that has been militarized and to lobby with the local churches and the LGUs on the struggles of the indigenous people in the area. Um, so that's, um, I think that's all for the programs and just to share also with you, uh, a recent uh, update uh, in terms of our of NCCP's response to um, the typhoon, no? the, the, the recent uh, the, the effect of the typhoon uh, Rolly, super typhoon Rolly. So um, the three Christian councils, humanitarian arms, have closely monitored and. Uh, the development and impact of super typhoon Rolly and has activated its local response. NCCP is coordinating with its regional ecumenical councils, NASA, Caritas Philippines with its 13 dioceses, and field rats uh, with the local churches in the area. Um, the three councils have also launched their local fundraising campaigns and global appeals. Um, and they have been they have received reports uh, from the local response uh, from uh, the local responses, uh, like um, serving hot meals to the evacuees, giving a food packs, opening its sanctuaries for temporary shelter, and many more. Health protocols are being considered in these efforts, and church workers in local jurisdictions have been actively coordinating with um, the LGUs. So um, this is an ongoing. Um, work uh, of our humanitarian program right now. So I guess um, that's it. And once again, um, NCCP's uh, contingent team, which I, I think I showed in the first slide, is really very suitable to the current um, situation that we have now. Um, with the worsening crisis and um, situation, the more, uh, I, the more that we should be resolved. Uh, to carry our theme, to lift our voices without fear. So we say no to red tagging, we say stop the killings, and we say end in the um, Also, we would like again to express our heartfelt thanks to UCC for your unwavering support and solidarity to NCCP and to the Filipino people. Mabuhay kayo at mabuhay tayong lahat. Magandang umaga po. Hi, Mabuhai. Thank you very much. Salama po, Aseli, for that presentation on behalf of the National Council of Churches. Just hold on, dear colleagues, for a few more minutes. Uh, let's listen to uh, Patricia Leeson from ICHIP Canada. Is Canada doing anything, or is ICHIP Canada doing anything in terms of... Um, the questions and challenges from the Philippines. Patricia Lizon. 
Thank you very much for the invitation, Jeffet, for sharing with you the role, uh, the work of iChirp Canada. I am sorry that I wasn't able to be here yesterday, but I was tasked with another job of uh, interviewing our licensed uh, lay uh, licensed worship leaders in the United Church in our region. And that took all day and into the evening. Um, so yes, we are doing some things. We're actually quite, we have been quite engaged. ITRIP Canada, International Coalition for Human Rights in the Philippines, Dash Canada, um, was, formula, was uh, born on, in uh, 2019, in May 2019. So we're a little over a year and a half old. And during that time, we've organized ourselves and created a structure and a, for, and a framework to work within. And we've also formed new, uh, uh, I was going to say new uh, satellite uh, groups in Canada, um, in Toronto, uh, Vancouver, Montreal, Edmonton, and some smaller groups in, in Calgary, et cetera, et cetera. So we're a growing concern. Um, and we're a coalition. So there are all kinds of other groups um, who are uh, working with us and we are working with them as we go forward. We're also part of the global iChirp uh, network and that network, as many of you know, includes people from Australia, New Zealand, United States, Europe, England, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, Canada, our, our chapter of iChirp, it, it was founded on a long history of already uh, work that had been going on before. For example, I was a part of the Beaconsfield Initiative, who is a member of iChirp Canada. Beaconsfield Initiative is a United Church initiative where, from Montreal, where we went to the Philippines and did some investigation on, on Canadian mining practices and human rights violations. And so we're amalgamating all the work of those different groups coming together and working together on the things. What, what have we been doing over the last year and a half? Well, we have focused on lobbying the Canadian government. We've lobbied the Canadian government on a number of issues. The uh, sale of, of military arms to the Philippines, if you remember the helicopter, Bell helicopter uh, fiasco, if I could use that word. I don't know if it was a fiasco, but it feels like a fiasco. Um, the, um, a number of other issues. Uh, the Human Rights Day, we contacted all of our members of parliament talking about human rights in, uh, in the Philippines, pushing uh, Canada to, to take a stronger stand. We have been before the, um, it's gonna get the right name of the group before I say it incorrectly, Global Affairs Canada. And we've met with them on a number of occasions, raising uh, our concern of human rights in, in the Philippines, asking them to, um, push the ambassador in in Manila um, to take some uh, more uh, direct action in relation to human rights defenders, political prisoners, and those kinds of issues. Particularly, we had uh, we got a bit of uh, of traction, of course, unfortunately, around the issue of uh, Baby River and and uh, that very sad situation. Um, and, uh, and so we were able to meet with, uh, we call it GAC, Gl Global Affairs Canada again. Um, we have a, a, a document in Canada that was produced by the Canadian government called Voices at Risk. That document, when you read that document, is, is actually quite a good document, but it needs some, some action to go with it. And so we're pushing, again, the government to take action. We've also been involved in the United Nations um, resolution, as you know, I'm sure most of you are familiar with that. And so Canada presented a, a report to the High Commissioner and we're, was very active in lobbying other embassies, countries, uh, in particular, again, our own government, obviously, um, to take a strong stand on that issue. Um, as you know, the outcome of that issue was not as uh, positive as we were hoping or as strong as we were hoping. And so um, iChirp globally, and uh, Canada is a part of this, is looking to uh, set up a, uh, an independent commission of investigation into human rights violations in the Philippines, a global people's initiative. And I think you've heard maybe uh, bits of that from maybe Mar Marvin shared that yesterday. Um, and so we'll be calling on you, uh, um, to offer your information, um, testimonies, uh, in, engage in that, that process. Of course, we're hoping to have a report to the 46, I think I've got the numbers correct, in March and then in June and then the 48th 
UN uh, Human Rights Commission, High Commission um, in September the 48th. So that's a big piece of work that Global ITERP has taken on and we'll be um, looking for some help and some support and some prayers as we move forward to accomplish that huge piece of work. Canada uh, has also, uh, ITERP Canada has also implemented um, a number of campaigns. We've been involved in the, uh, the Cordillere campaign that was uh, kicked off in Wendell's here and uh, uh, in, in uh, October, in September, I think. Um, we did two workshops, webinars on the global, uh, on the Cordillere situation, one in English and one in French. And so it was our first French um, outreach um, on this issue. We've had a lot of support in the French community on this issue. And in fact, our member of parliament, our bloc member of parliament who, who attended this workshop and supports our work, um, made a huge state, made a, a very powerful, passionate statement in the House of Commons three weeks ago. And that's quite a, a, an, a, an accomplishment to get our voice on the House of, on the floor of the House of Commons in the Canadian government. We also have been involved in the um, political prisoners campaign, which is ongoing. And thanks to the United Church and Jeffett's work, we've been able to set up a defense fund through the United Church. Um, and are looking for finances to support the, the, the uh, legal work of those cases. Um, and we're also looking to enlist family member, uh, I mean, sorry, other people in Canada, other members outside of ITERP to support families of the political prisoners, to support the political prisoners in a variety of sundry ways, writing letters, uh, that type of work. Um, we're also kicking off the Negros campaign on Friday evening. And um, I'm not part of that planning team, so I'm not sure, sure what's planned, but I, it'll be certainly powerful and worth uh, spending some time listening to. The, we also created an e-petition in Canada and a government. We can bring issues to the floor of the House of Commons through a number of ways. One is through a member of parliament speaking as the, our block member did for us, but also by bringing an e-petition, which means we, have a member of parliament support the petition. And then that petition, we get signatures from the Canadian population. And then if we get 4,000 signatures, we need the United Church signatures here, folks. <laughs> well, um, we get 4,000 signatures, then that petition comes to the floor of the government. And so it's, it's, it's a, a way of education. It's a way of asking for action. That petition is focusing on Canadian mining practices in the Philippines and human rights violations. And we've, we are doing this, ITERP Canada is doing this in conjunction with Mining Watch Canada. And we're focusing on Oceana Gold, which was mentioned a couple of times. <laughs> uh, the situation with Oceana Gold, which is a Canadian mine, a mining company and an Australian mining company. So we're quite pleased with, with first of all, getting a member of parliament of the Canadian government to support that and to move it forward. And so we're uh, using it as an educational tool. And with a number of our major unions across Canada have decided and uh, have agreed to support us in that collecting of signatures, but also doing the education piece around the Canadian mining situation and human rights uh, violations. The other piece of work we're doing with the Canadian government is asking for a subcommittee asking our subcommittee on foreign affairs on human rights to uh, hold a hearing um, and we're on the first rung of that ladder they've tenis, uh, they've they've sort of agreed to it we haven't got it in writing so until you have it on paper you don't know but that subcommittee on human rights if they hold a hearing then we will be able to present again to foreign affairs canada the, the a very important piece of the canadian government um, the stories of the human rights uh, violations in, in the Philippines. And we will be bringing witnesses uh, from the from Philippines to speak before that, that's that hearing. And so, um, as you can see, we've been doing a fair bit of work over the last year and a half. And so I'm very pleased to hear the stories and amazed at the amount of work that you all are doing. Um, and um, just hope we can be supportive and 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 lift up the cause of 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 your work and ministry 
um, uh, seeking justice and human rights for all people. So thank you again, Jafet, uh, for inviting me uh, to speak. And um, Thank you very much, Patricia. Thank you. So the United Church of Canada is part of ICHIP and we are in the struggles together. We are in the trenches together. Friends, I want us to go in groups just for about um, 10 minutes with one assignment. What one thing of action, one major action point for the Canadians and one major action point for the Filipino partners? Just discuss out of these two days, what one thing could you mention needs intensified action? One major action point for the Canadians, one major action point for the Filipinos. Let's just do uh, 10 minutes in our groups and then we'll come back with one person reporting from each group. And I will ask uh, each head of each organization to say the last words. So the, the General Secretary of NCCP, the General Secretary of UCCP, etc just to say final words as we conclude our time together. So Carla will now divide us into groups. Um, I think we may have, there we are. Good, let's get into those groups and just 10 minutes and we will be back. One major action. Uh, Mary Carr, I don't know if you want to go to your breakout group or AC Mary. Oh, okay. Hi there. Did I lose you? Hi, we went into breakout group. Frank, would you like to go into a breakout group or? Uh, yeah, uh, actually, I have already joined, but you know, I just turned on my uh, microphone and uh, camera on my I iPhone. <laughs> so, okay. please let me join. Yeah, please let me join. Uh, okay, I think you are in breakout group four. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay, one second. Okay. You see, Mariano, I'm not quite sure if you want to join a breakout group. Thank you very much. At least we've all managed to be there. Short time eh, to, to discuss so many things, but thank you for coming back. Let's have the group representatives from each group just to say, what was it that you mentioned? Please just uh, unmute yourself and say, what is this one action point? Yes, go ahead, Pastor Noel. Uh, I, I was made a spokesperson. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> um, 
And, and uh, two things that came, uh, one from coming from the Philippines, which was uh, told to us by the two bishops and as well, and two coming from Canada. Oh, we're, there are three are coming from the Philippines, uh, Bishop Labuntog, Bishop Marigsa, and uh, Pastor Frank, and two from Canada, uh, Ate Joseph Arcadilla and me. Coming from the Philippines, what they are proposing is an independent fact-finding mission be conducted so as to pressure the government because they are, as they told us, uh, the government is quite rattled with this kind of action. They take notice uh, of this. International action is one of them in, mm -hmm. in, 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 in many fronts. Uh, coming from Canada, I told them that there are 80,000 Filipinos already in Winnipeg alone, but also trying to raise awareness not only in the Filipino community, but also to the regional, to the whole United Church of Canada. And uh, what I'm thinking is Region 5, for example, where I now are serving. And so, you know, sort of widening the audience and, and trying to disseminate as much information as I, we can, so that this concern be taken up. Mm -hmm. That's from our group. Thank you very much, Noel. Next group. Anybody who was uh, a rep? Yes. Uh, yes, Becca. This, this is Becca, but I think that my uh, camera might have problems. My internet is low. In our your, group- Your voice is clear. Okay, good. Um, in our group, what we discussed was uh, that more about how we tell the story and that um, what came out from the Canada side is that uh, maybe it would be good if the, if the partners in the Philippines worked together to collaborate or to weave the stories better so that when we tell what's happening to our partners in Canada, uh, it, there's not as much repetition. So it was very clear in, today, in the last two days discussions that red tagging and vilification, which was also the keynote address of Bishop Parigsa, with something that is found throughout, but that maybe we should be talking more about different things. Then from the Philippine side, there was actually a similar idea that we need to work better on how we tell the story or how we shape the narrative so that our partners in Canada are better able to use that, both understand what's happening and use that narrative in doing advocacy work from the Canada side. Thank you, Becca. Next group. The third group. The third group. We're actually going backwards. This would be um, Patricia's uh, team or uh, Imo or. Yeah. yeah, I see Imo has gone to sleep. I think he's tired now. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think Father Rex was our representative. Oh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Bishop Rex, why did yeah, your group? Well, I, have to, I have to pass it on to the boss, right? Patricia, Patricia was already, I thought she was writing it down. Oh, Patricia <laughs> was writing down. <laughs> well, yeah. Writing some notes, yes. But, okay, if you'd like, I'll share. I did write a couple of things down, actually. Um, again, we talked in our group a bit about the story, shaping the narrative. And, uh, and I think that from from the Canada side might be helpful. Um, the other piece was um, the uh, di looking at um, unity in, in the Philippines. I, Father Rex, I hope I'm capturing this okay. But the, the, for all of the folks in the, the Philippine folks to, to stay uh, together, uh, they can, we can't afford to have um, rifts in, in the group, in the, in the ecumenical bishops forum and all of these different institutions and organizations that are working together and we need to, th those groups need to be working uh, in solidarity and uh, checking stories out with each other rather than uh, we're uh, um, facing a false news or gossip or whatever, or red tagging, making sure you check it out to be sure you can stay strong together. Um, <clears throat> the other piece that came up was the uh, defending the, defending the, the uh, defenders um, and uh, working on that, building that solidarity and shaping that narrative so that the Canadian group can, can work on that uh, with some 
more confidence and uh, direction. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. The next group, we have two more. No, this is the last group. Oh, that okay. was the last group. Okay. This is the last group is Ariel, Kim, Mary, Carr, Mervyn, Rosemary, and Wendell. Okay. Thank you very much. Final closing comments. Let's start with record. No, no, no. We're missing the last group. The last group. Oh, we... <laughs> <laughs> yes. Who's uh, reporting for the last group? Well, we didn't actually assign anybody, so. Uh... Thank you, Rosemary, for offering. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I would say from, from a Canadian perspective, we, uh, we talked about the need for education and, uh, and solidarity, but to it and make sure that the energy continues, that we get, uh, we hear stories and we get all excited and then uh, we need to keep that energy going and we need to make sure that more people are aware and that we're connected so that we're giving a stronger voice mm -hmm. and a stronger representation because we do have the freedom to speak to our um, government officials far more freely than you can do in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. And from the Filipinos' perspective, it's to continue to be faithful and to to not be afraid that the church cannot stop what it's done and is doing. That you need to overcome fear and uh, heighten your resistance and maximize available venues to have your voices be heard. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Are, are, is, are we done now with the group, Scala? <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay, so let's start with record, just closing comments. Marika? Hello, Jabet. Uh, this is Bill. Yes, B yes, Bill. Yeah, go, for go us ahead. in record, we'll continue to cooperate with uh, Yaya. For us in record, we will continue to cooperate and participate in the struggle of indigenous peoples in the world era by mm -hmm. forming absolutely different church formations. Uh, we, have great, uh, we participated in the creation of such uh, uh, church formations in order for them to be educated and uh, participate in societal issues uh, in Thank order you. for them to uh, uh, be in solidarity and to uh, uh, advocate the, the issues, particularly the indigenous peoples here in the Cordillera. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Jaffer. Thank you, Bill. And uh, the CPA, Cordillera People's Alliance, Bestang or Window, who is here? Closing comments? Yeah, again, um, like what uh, I mentioned yesterday, thank you for uh, inviting and uh, participating in this online meeting and conference. Uh, I, we have learned a lot and uh, learned further that uh, we have uh, friends and partners uh, miles away. And so we are not alone and that will uh, give us more uh, inspiration and courage to, do, to continue our just struggle. Again, uh, warmest greetings from the Korea People's Alliance. Uh, good evening there and uh, <laughs> good to, <laughs> I don't know what's time now, uh, almost midday here in the, in the Philippines. Again, uh, sala salamat, mabuhay tayong lahat. Thank you very much. AQ Voice, Marvin. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Jaffet. Thank you for all our, to all our Canadian friends. Uh, I have always uh, mentioned this many times, the most consistent uh, international partner that the ecumenical movement in the Philippines have through the years has been, is the United Church of Canada and we're very grateful for that. So on behalf of the organizations that make up the ecumenical voice, our uh, heartfelt um, uh, thank you. Thank you, Marvin. EBF, Bishop Rex, uh, final words? Japet, you slowly uh, make your way to the Philippines and I will treat you to something exotic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you. I can't wait. <laughs> yes, I will go to the division. Not the roasters. Uh, <laughs> no, not that one. It's too fat. It's too... Anyway, Long live international solidarity. Thank you, Bishop. UCCP, Bishop Labuntok. 
Uh, let me, uh, yeah, sisters and brothers, let me just uh, say our uh, thanks for inviting us to be part of this. This is really a good way to connect with each other. And as we said in our sharing this morning, that uh, let me just go back to the text which Pastor Frank uh, mentioned in Second Corinthians that we are afflicted every, in every way, but we are not crushed, crushed. Perplex, but not driven to despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Mm -hmm. With you, with our accompanying us, that will be a great assurance. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Good morning and good evening there. Thank you. NCCP. Okay. Uh, Bishop Marigza. Of course, we thank you very much, and we should continue to uh, pray for one another. I shared this uh, during the GC42, uh, and uh, I think it's worth repeating, because this was a question that was raised by both Japheth and Michael uh, yesterday uh, with regards to living in a situation like this, and it goes this way. We have lived with fear so long, and we have made a remarkable discovery that often fear does not travel alone and accompanied, not far from fear, dreads courage. So despite the presence of fear, we have learned to summon courage, courage brought forth by our coming together in solidarity, in common advocacies, impelled by our Christian faith, inspired by our people's struggles. Yes, fear lurks, but courage looms even much larger as we immerse ourselves on the ground with our people. Mabuhay, thank you very much, and God bless. Thank you. Thank you very much, dear colleagues. Uh, our General Secretary, the Reverend Michael Blair, was with us, but you can imagine that uh, this being his first full week in the office, he has so many assignments. He had to run into another meeting. I think it will go on almost close to midnight. So he had to go away. But um, he greatly appreciates all of you and what we are doing. From the UCC side, we want to pledge our continued accompaniment with each one of you, our partners. We will walk with you. We know that resources are challenged, particularly because of COVID-19. The General Council, as we wrote to all of you, you know, lost a number of staff, and we also had to cut some relationships. We are not funding certain organizations, but for some reason, all of us in the General Council are very protective with the Philippines. I don't know what you people have done to us. <laughs> I don't know what you've done to us. I don't know what you feed us when we come there. <laughs> <laughs> so even if the resources are limited, we still want to share the limited resources that we have because we believe strongly in the United Church of Canada that these are resources that belong to God and that we are just stewards of these resources and that they are to be shared. So we'll struggle together with whatever may be available uh, for us, even if the situation has changed. Yes, we did lose some members of staff and we are not very sure because you know we are not out of the woods as yet. Some programmatic directions have greatly changed, but thank God the global partnership work was preserved. Other work, pieces of work have just disappeared and we are all trying to figure out what will it mean for our witness and our life as United Church going forward. But also we will continue to pray for you and we will continue to pray for each other. But also we want to continue paying our solidarity in whichever way. It may not be money. If we can write that letter and it can help to amplify your voice, we want to amplify your voices. So the public amplification of the voices of our Filipino partners is one of the hallmarks that we would like to proceed with. We know currently there is the recent typhoon, 
We have raised the prayer today already, and we are going to raise a soft appeal. Whatever resources will come from there, we want to share them with you, our partners. And you know how the story goes. It's, it's you to tell us, to ask and say, we would like to apply it in the following way. <laughs> so uh, the United Church of Canada does not any longer give to whom it may concern, how, uh, however you may wish to give. The United Church of Canada will always respond to concepts that say the NCCP in partnership with Act Alliance are proposing such a budget. We want to do the following. Or the UCCP is specifically going to operate in this area. This is our budget. And from the little resources we have and what may come in, we want to, to be able to support you and to support your work. So friends, thank you very much for your time and thank you for all that you have shared. All these pieces have been recorded and uh, they are being widely shared with the constituencies of the United Church of Canada. Uh, for those people who were either partly here and had to leave for other meetings or were not here at all. So thank you, thank you, Mabuhai, Mabuhai. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> Jafet, thank you. Thank you, friends. And uh, thank you. Good, good day to you. Yeah,